I'm Billy Turriff, full-time property investor and founder of Kensington Finance. In property, there are some key elements that you really need to, to focus on to help to grow your business. You know, One of them is finance, another one is process, and a third one is people. And what I thought I would do today is share with you the process I've gone through to um, build a team specific to me, but I think if you follow the same steps and the same approach, you should be able to identify what kind of team um, is right for you and what roles you need to have in-house versus out-house. First off though, why do you actually need a team? A lot of people start out in property and we kind of want freedom once you actually have a team, you give up some of that freedom because you've got to be there to train them, you've got to be there to direct them, you've got to be there to, to, to help them. And the reality to me is like most things in property, it's actually about leverage. And you will give up some of your freedom initially to do those tasks of onboarding, training, etc. But the reality is from the output the team then gives you, you will actually get a lot more freedom back. And what could you be doing with some of that freedom yourself? Well, there's a couple of things. You know, one, you could be focusing on tasks that are far higher value to the business. So for example, going out sourcing deals, really looking at your financing, rather than actually having to deal with like utility providers, um, maintenance requests, etc. Also, though, each of us will have different areas that we're good at. Um, I think I've got I don't know, okay flair on the, the finance side. Surprisingly, my interior design skills aren't very good. So by getting other people on board who've got better skill sets, you'll get a better end product. Um, but ultimately as well, if we can focus on the tasks that we're good at and that's within our flow, um, we'll enjoy it more as well. So what I'm going to do now is talk through the high-level approach I'd suggest you do to get a team in place. First thing you need to do is think about what I call an operating model. What are the building blocks for your, your, your business? And, and I'll go through what mine are in, in a moment. Secondly, you then need to think about, okay, there's a whole lot of activities under each of those building blocks. Which ones would you want to insource? Which ones would you want to outsource? Which ones can you maybe get actual technology systems or processes to, to use for them? Then you need to think about, okay, what are the first hires you want to take on place and how will that build out over time? Um, as you take on the hires, you then also need to think about what kind of environment are you creating? You know, I'm very much of a kind of a lifestyle business, so I want a small team with quite flexible arrangements, but I deliberately also want people who are kind of um, on board with me rather than having to add an extra layer of communications and doing stuff offshore. Um, potential, there could be potential cost implications to my business there, but I'm okay with that just in terms of the of the ease of it and trying to build a small kind of company culture and, and, and values. And then finally, once you've got your team up and running, you need to think about, well, how are you actually going to manage them? How are you actually going to direct them? And what processes do you want to put in place for that? So I'll talk through each of those areas one by one now. So the first thing you kind of need to think about for your team is actually how do you want your business to, to operate? And what I'm going to do just now is share with you the operating model. And that's just, a, I suppose it's my ex-consultant days where that's from, but it's really just the same as the plans for your, your business. The operating model I'm going to share with you is what we use for our buy-to-hold business. Okay, Buy-to-hold business is roughly about 40 units. It's about 150 rooms. Uh, mainly multi-let mixture of professionals and uh, and students. Um, the operating model we then use for Kensington Finance, our coaching and our development businesses is slightly different. So you need to take each business that you have and look at how should it operate. And before you can work out how it should operate, you need to think of what are the core building blocks for that business. So for a buy-to-hold business, I've got seven core blocks that, that I use. Five that are specific to the buy tool business, and then two blocks that actually we utilize and go across all the other businesses. So the first five blocks that we've got is our sourcing. 
part of the business. So how do we actually go and find sites and, and acquire them? Secondly, once a site is, is acquired, what is the legal process that it, it must go through? Also, from a legal side, there's a legal process in terms of what the company has to do for who we hire, how um, we comply with any legislation, etc. That, that, that's out there. Once we've then got um, properties, we obviously need to fill the rooms, so that's crucial for them. So you look at the marketing and the sales. Luckily, there's lots of organisations called letting agents out there, so, so we work with a lot of them to do that, but that's kind of our, th our third area. The fourth area we've then got is with 40 units, there's quite a lot of ongoing management for it, and you want to kind of preempt some of that. So we've got um, a facilities building block in it. Um, ultimately, there's a lot of money swishing about in terms of acquiring these sites, in terms of rental coming in, in terms of going out as well, and hopefully having some, some profit left. So we've got quite, um, you, so ultimately you're going to have a finance block, and, I, and I'll talk into detail some of the individual areas under that in a minute. So that's kind of the five key blocks that are really specific to buy to hold. Also, we then have a number of areas across marketing and across admin, as our other two building blocks that are specific to the buy to hold, but also the, the, the other businesses as well. So as I say, that's really your high level building blocks. Once you, you know your high level building blocks or operating model, as I'm calling it, you then need to drill down and teach them. So let's take finance to start with. What are the things that my buy to hold business needs to do from a kind of financial perspective? Well, we've got um, accounts payable, so when we've got invoices, we need to be able to, 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 to process them. Um, we've got a whole lot of houses that we need to be able to get monthly P&Ls for. Um, so that's our kind of our bookkeeping is, is is what I call it. We need to raise mortgages, so we need to have a mortgage broker to support us with that. We need to ensure the houses are insured, so we need a policy to get the insurance on an ongoing basis and make sure we've got the appropriate cover. We've got regulatory um, requirements we need to, to, to adhere to, so et cetera, et cetera. So the important thing is you get that building block and then you think of what are the key areas under underneath it. If we take another one, for example, so our facilities, um, and that kind of goes two ways. So we've got facilities that we'll do preemptive, which will be the facilities manager going out and actually inspecting the houses, um, looking at any immediate stuff that needs to be done, but sort of also preemptive, I mean, in terms of, you know, what our cycle is for repainting, what our cycle is for clearing gutters, what our cycle is for jet washing, etc. So that's stuff that is kind of managed on an ongoing basis. But then also, depending on what work is required, you may need a handyman to do that work. You may need an electrician to do that work. You may need a plumber to do that work. So it's having a list of those trades by specialism that, that, that you'll need as well. So when you look at each of those individual areas that you've got, so again, if we go back to the finance and you think of likes of um, bookkeeping, for example, your choice then is do I actually hire someone that is going to come and work with me and actually um, as a staff member and do all my bookkeeping, or am I actually going to go to a third-party bookkeeper provider? Similarly, if I go to maintenance, am I actually going to have a plumber that I'm going to have on my books full-time or am I going to work with a couple of um, lads who, who, who are on the trades? And there's a couple of things that I'd suggest that you really need to look at. You know, one is if people outside your organisation can do the job better than you could do it internally, that's potentially a reason to go there. Secondly is that if you don't have enough work to keep that person going and you're not at scale, um, it would make more sense to go to uh, um, third party. Um, third, also in terms of cover, if you take everything in-house and your bookkeeper goes sick for a couple of months, you're potentially in, in, in a difficult situation, similarly with your trades guys, whereas if you're actually using a firm and they've got a couple of plumbers or they've got a couple of bookkeepers, you've got backup. Um, and also, you know, one of the key things to me is what gives your business the competitive advantage? Of those seven building blocks I said, 
Um, all of them will help your business, but I would argue um, it's really sourcing that will give you the competitive advantage. It's once you get the good deals, the other stuff can then be actually copied or paid for. And I'm not saying it's easy. You know, we pay a lot to our finance people, we pay a lot to our trades people, we pay a lot to our interior designers, etc. Um, so I'm certainly not saying it's easy and there's technical people to do it, but in terms of managing the portfolio, what I want to do is create the areas that we need the competitive advantage for in-house, which is on the sourcing, and then for all the other areas, I want to be able to use external parties who have got um, better scale than us, better technical knowledge, and, and more flexibility around it. At the same time, you do need some rules. You can't just have 60 people reporting into you externally. So what I'd like to do is now is talk through the rules that I think you should typically recruit first and talk about how that will help you in terms of driving the business, but also how it may also help you um, managing those third-party providers. Okay, so um, as I said, to, to grow a business, you're obviously going to have staff. Um, you can't just outsource source everything. There's a couple of um, jobs and a sequence that I think you should recruit and, and hire people in. The first one to me that's a complete no-brainer is an admin person. Okay, if you um, One of the downsides with properties, there is a lot of admin. So there's direct debit for Virgin, for um, TV licensing, etc. For each house, if you're doing a multi-let, so there's probably five, six different touch points with different providers that, that you've got. Buying a house in itself, you've got your legal documents, you've got your mortgage offer, etc. So there's a, there's a whole lot of admin stuff that's related to the houses. There's also a whole lot of admin stuff in, in our day-to-day -day life. So whether that's travel, whether that's calendar, etc. And what you'll actually find is a lot of um, property investors or property entrepreneurs are actually not very good at admin and, and managing their stuff. I, I certainly am in. So having an admin person, I really see it as two reasons. One, it just gives me so much time back to focus on the stuff I enjoy more and also the stuff that I think drives the um, business. And also the second reason is the value of your time. So if you're leading a business and your competitive advantage is in sourcing and is getting the, the, the deals, that will have a certain value to you. And a little tip I do is each year I work out what is my hourly rate. So I look at the combined profits for my personal portfolio and the businesses. I then multiply that by two because I want to be able to continue to grow the business. And I then divide it by 48, 48 weeks in the year if you take four weeks holiday, divide it by 40 hours, and that gives you an, an hourly salary, which is X. And when I've got jobs, I look at it and kind of say that, you know, should I be focusing on, on this job here that is worth, I don't know, £12 an hour if I'm dealing with utility providers? Or should I be worth trying to go and source a deal that I'm potentially going to get below market value that's going to have a potential of 30 grand but might take 20 hours to, to, to secure, do 30 hours, keep the math simple. So that's worth 1000 or should I be doing some admin worth job that's worth between 10 and and £15? And if I ever find myself, which I do, going into the, the, the lower end task, I'll kind of say about, do I need someone else to support with that? Is that a task or, or elements we can outsource? So as I say, with admin through rules to start with, it's a complete no-brainer to me for two reasons. One, the time it will free up. There's a whole lot of admin with houses and just running properties. Also then in terms of, and that's the main reason, but then the second reason is, is also in terms of managing your own resources internally to you so that you're focusing on the, the, the stuff that's higher value. And also to a third reason that's probably important is for a lot of investors, it's not within their flow doing admin. We're not very good at it. So um, you'll get the person that's better than you anyway, but also it means that you can focus on parts of the business that you enjoy more. The second rule I think you probably want to look at is to get a marketing coordinator, a marketing manager on board. Why do you want to do that? Well, there's a couple of reasons. If you can't market yourself, if you can't market your, your product, you're not going to get any sales. Um, they, they, they don't just happen overnight. 
you need to think about that. So for our business, for example, we do outsource a lot of our marketing to the, the letting agents, so they'll actually market those, those, those houses direct. So for my business, when I'm talking about marketing, that's going across the buy to hold business, it's going across Kensington Finance, it's going across the, the mentoring, and it's going across the, the, the development. The reason marketing, I think, is such a key area as well now is because of social media. So whereas in the past we would spend a lot of time maybe going through strategies, analysing, are you going to put um, an advert on TV versus press, etc. Social media has allowed everyone to go global over, over, overnight. Um, so that's great. Part of the, the challenges with marketing though as well is there is lots of different stuff. So who does your website? How do you do your business cards? what channels should you use, etc. So it's probably one of the most diverse areas that you'll get. And what I find that, again, unless you're going to get someone who's going to um, work with you full time, and even on a 40 hour basis, they probably won't have all those skill sets. So what you actually want is, first off, is quite a good generalist that knows how to um, specialize deep into one or two of those areas but then can work with different providers for you. And again, for, for marketing, ultimately, if you want to grow your business, you've got to market each year. So that's the second rule that I would recommend that you take in place. And being um, aware as well that each of these individuals, whilst they're working within your business and they're reporting to you, they will be managing a number of third parties. So the marketing person may be talking to some print people for you, they may be talking to some events that they're organising for you in terms of the hotel, they uh, may be talking to the, the, the web hosting company. So all of a sudden, you've now got gatekeepers between you and another four or five people um, that, that you've outsourced areas to. A third area that we recruited on, and we've done that this year, is the facilities management role. And again, you need to get at a certain size. Um, I'd argue we probably waited too long for this, um, and I've probably been doing the role for the last couple of years and doing it badly. Um, so we, we, we made the decision this year to go and get a facilities manager on role. And that's simply because of the size of our portfolio. At 40 houses, um, you know, letting agents are great in terms of doing their quarterly inspection reports and telling you what's happening, but ultimately it's the business's assets, okay? And I will not, um, just outsource that 100% to, to someone. So there's a little bit of a control element in it for me. But also, I've seen what happens when houses are well managed and when they're, when they're not so well managed. So when you get at a certain level, and it's probably up to, to each person to do that, but I'd probably argue whether it's 10, 20, I definitely recommend getting that, that rule in place. And there's a couple of key tasks that you'll, you'll want them to do, you know, is help you come up with what is your planned maintenance for each of your houses. So, you know, on an ongoing basis, you do want to be um, cleaning yards. You want to be making sure the gutters are, are cleared out. You want to have a plan for, you know, how frequently you're going to paint the front of the house, etc. So that's what I kind of call the more the preventative maintenance process that we want to put in place. Also want to do go around, things happen with with houses, stuff gets knocked on walls, people do stuff to fire doors that they, they, they shouldn't do. So I want to just go around and check the, the, the asset with them. As we're doing that, we'll identify areas that, that could be improved. And then third, there will be one-off items that will, 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 will happen. So there'll be damp, there'll be a leak to a roof, uh, something will happen with electrics and you want to have a person that can then coordinate all your different trades um, that can go and fix them. Again, a lot of the time we use the process with the letting agents for this, basically up to a certain amount, and then above a certain amount we'll take it, um, when I say in-house, with our own trades teams who are all self-employed, have their own businesses, but our facilities manager then liaises with them on an ongoing basis, tells them what the problem is, tells them where the house is, checks the work's been done, then tells them to send the invoice for payment. So that's the three um, first jobs I would recommend that you should typically look at, except each business is different. That's the, the, the three jobs that, that I've um, recruited. Thought what I'd like to do now is just kind of share with you 
how you need you know, to put some simple processes and systems in place to be effective with that. So once you've got your team on board and, and each individual recruit as, as you go along, you need to think about how are you going to manage them, how are you going to lead them. And one of the mistakes I made to start with when I kind of took on my first admin person, basically kind of always said, here's all the admin stuff, you need to go and solve all the, all, all the issues with it. And just expected that people could read my brain and, and understand what had happened historically. The, the reality is people can't do that. And what you have to remember is that with new staff, what you have to do is you need to put in a significant amount of time and effort to start with to get them on boarded, to get them trained, to get them to understand the, the, the processes. And once that's done, that heavy lifting up front, they then should be able to operate effectively and efficiently with a guidance on an ongoing basis. But you need to put in the work first. Um, we do that through a couple of key sort of ways. You know, we do have a company process manual, um, and that's a live document, so it's never finished. I think we, we did our first one probably about two years ago. We typically update it a couple of times a year, and we do kind of a, a deep dive into it in January. What's the purpose of that? You know, one, it is to talk about how the, how the business operates. So a couple of reasons, if anything happens to me, there's still a process and systems in place that so someone could come in and, and take it over. Secondly, um, if one of the team members leaves, they get another job, they decide to take some time out from work, what they actually do and the process for that is all written um, there. And then thirdly, like any organization, we can improve in, in, in areas. And we like to look at it on an, on an annual basis and kind of say what's working well, what isn't working well, what areas do we need to fix. And we typically kind of do that in January and February, see what systems are broken, not giving us the full results and, and look at them. Also sometimes, you know, we did this, remember we, when we did our first finance ones, we thought about here's all these different reports we can have and kind of came up with about 20 different management accounts, different ways to look at the data. And we realised that was overkill. So as we're actually running them, we realise we're not spending the time to analyse them because it's not really giving us the value that we need. So sometimes we'll, as we're looking at stuff that's broken, we'll also say, what can we get rid of each year? What isn't driving the business forward? So first thing is you'll need a company-wide process manual. Secondly, then, with each employee, um, we kind of sit down and talk about those. You know, you think of that operating model I talked about and the, the tasks underneath it we kind of say, okay, what are the tasks you need to do? So I think it's kind of the admin stuff. You know, there's stuff from, okay, we've got to collect the, the, the mail on a daily basis. Um, we've got to do the calendar um, on, on, on a daily basis. On a weekly basis, however, we pay invoices, okay? On a monthly basis, we need to run the, the management accounts. On a monthly basis, we need to do what we call portfolio review which is looking at all the legislative stuff, so making sure our stuff from like TV licenses are up to date to our HMO licenses are, are up to date. So each person will have a checklist of um, activities that they have to do, some of them weekly, some of them monthly, some of them quarterly, some of them, 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 them annually, and that's the equivalent of their job description, but you know, yeah, my, my bullshit, without writing 400 words, it's the key tasks that they need to do. It's a one-pager, they, they, they can take it, 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 it away with them. The detail of the processes that you may get in a job description is then kept in the process manual, and because that will change, you know, at the moment we're using zero for our accountants to say it's a great system to use, but I don't know what new technology will, will, will come out in a couple of years. Similarly, on the, on the marketing side, if you think of what all the social platforms are now there's kind of a new one that comes out every day so some of them will change and then each year that that, that, that gets updated and then um, what we do is um, we use Google Sheets as a simple kind of tracker of stuff that people need to do and um, make sure everyone knows what they're focusing on kind of um, the week basis typically we'll have a check-in with people each week just look at their list, you know, find out, they're kind of comfortable that is there anything they're unsure of. Do we know the priority order that, 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 that it's got to be done in? So say what's kind of high, medium, low, and there always is a priority. If you don't tell people what the priority is, don't be surprised if you, if you don't get the stuff that, that needs to be focused on. Also, you know, do they need some help with that? You know, do we need to get an expert support on? Can we give anything else to, to a third party? 
So we do, and, and that's what I call the kind of the, the planning check-in, so that's one bit. And then there's kind of formal blockaging off that, that, that we do. And the formal blockaging off, as I said, is like doing that portfolio review once a month, doing the finance review once a month. So my calendar and, and admin will have three hours blocked off for each of them. For marketing, we will want to do certain videos, certain case studies, certain tips. So again, once a month, we'll schedule half a day to do um, filming, etc. So again, just a summary of those tips, your process manual to go across, kind of a, a task description, which ultimately becomes the, 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 the rule description, um, weekly check-in using Google Sheets so we keep it live, we can review it, and then formal check-ins for, for bigger tasks. Um, Hope that's helpful for you. Um, as I say, that's the journey that we've been on so far for, for our buy to hold business. Um, I expect that will change a little bit next year as things evolve in, in, in other businesses. And um, I want to maybe move some of my time to, to other areas. And, um, you know, just the important thing is to really look at it each year and work out what works best for you and, and, and tweak it. As I say, the experience to date with myself and working with a lot of other investors, certainly going at kind of an admin, marketing, facilities role, I believe would be the roles that would give you the, the greatest value um, to your business as you start to grow and scale it up. Thanks for listening. Um, if you've got any comments or you'd like any other information about kind of the team structures or the role descriptions, please drop me a message and I'm happy to share.